Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Town of Las Gatas Planning Commission meeting of Monday, October 17th, 2016. The meeting is now called to order. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to silence your devices, and I will look to Mr. Paulson to call roll. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen? Here. Commissioner Hudis? Here. Commissioner O'Donnell? Here. Vice Chair Kane? Here. And Chair Badami? Here. Would everyone please stand and join Vice Chair Kane as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Town of Los Gatos strongly encourages participation in the public process with verbal and written comments. Members of the public may speak on any item on the agenda when it is heard, which we only have one item, or any matter not on the agenda under verbal communications. To speak on any item, please complete a speaker's card. I have a few completed here. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to complete the card, follow the instructions on the back, and turn it over to a staff member. We have written communications this evening for item number two. Have the commissioners had an opportunity to read the correspondence? Does anyone need more time? Commissioner Hudis. Um, I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to absorb this last letter that came in. Hopefully we'll have some testimony to describe it, but there's a fair amount of detail in it and coming in at the time it has. I, I, I've read it, but I don't believe I really understand it. Thank you, Commissioner Hudis. We don't have any requested continuances this evening. I'll move on to subcommittee reports in the case that any of the commissioners have had recent subcommittee meetings. Seeing none, we have no uh, reports. Verbal communications, I see no cards. If anybody would like to speak to us tonight, please come forward. Seeing no one come forward, I'll move to our consent calendar, which typically is the approval of the minutes but we also don't have any minutes, so we'll continue moving on to our first public hearing, which is item number two. 300 Marchmont Drive, the annual review of a conditional use permit modification to increase the school enrollment of an existing private school, Hillbrook School, on property zoned HR1, APNs 532-10-001 and 532-11-011. Ms. Puga, I understand you're providing us with a staff report this evening. I am. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. On November 3rd, 2015, the Town Council held a public hearing for a six-month review of the CUP and found that Hillbrook was in compliance with the maximum number of daily vehicle trips. On August 31st of this summer, Hillbrook School vested their CUP by increasing the number of students by 23 for the 2016-2017 school year. Hillbrook is now subject to the conditions of approval attached as Exhibit 3. Condition 25 of the CUP requires that the Planning Commission conduct an annual review to determine if the school is in compliance with their CUP. Pursuant to Condition 19, the town's traffic consultant, W. Trans, completed a video review of the traffic for the fall 2016 semester on the days of October 4th, 5th, and 6th. As discussed in the report, These three days did not exceed the maximum of 880 daily vehicle trips. Hillbrook School may also designate 10 days per year that are referred to as exception days and shall not exceed 960 daily vehicle trips. September 9th and September 15th of the fall 2016 semester had been identified as exception days on Hillbrook's school calendar. Review of the census data found that both days were under both the maximum daily vehicle trips for an exception day and the maximum daily vehicle trips for a non-exception day. In conclusion, staff recommends that the Planning Commission find that Hillbrook School is in compliance with their conditional use permit. There is also a desk item before you this evening which contains a public comment in addition to a revised traffic report due to a calculation error between the percentage difference for the census data and video count on October 4th. This completes staff's presentation, and we are here with PPW staff and the town's consultant, W. Trans, for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Puga. Uh, Questions for staff from Commissioners. Commissioner Hansen. Uh, I have several questions, but I'll start with a couple. Um, One question I had, and this um, came up from 
my own personal experience as well as comments from some of the public. Um, it's relative to item 20 in the conditions of approval for the CUP, and it's about bus stops. It says the school may continue to use bus stops. Any new or existing bus stop must be approved by Los Gatos Parks and Public Works as a suitable and safe place for a bus stop. Um, I personally have had the experience that was described by some of the public where on um, Shannon Road, um, the bus stops right there at the intersection right across from Blossom Hill and it blocks traffic and it's been a big problem. And um, so then it made me wonder what is the approval process and what is the approved list of bus stops? I can refer to our PPW staff to answer that question. All right, would uh, PPW like to respond? Thank you, Lisa Peterson, town engineer. So to address the first question regarding the Shannon Road bus stop, um, we have had discussions with the commission and also with council in the past during the past reviews of the modification of the conditional use permit um, for this application. And this, the bus stop at Shannon had been reviewed in the past and has continued to be reviewed both by the town traffic engineer as well as the town's police department. Uh, the police department recently looked at it again. They found that the roadway um, is, a, it's, they feel it's a good location for a bus stop. They feel that the roadway has been signed, no parking. The shoulder is wide enough, it's easily visible. Uh, children exiting um, the passenger side of the door, uh, bus door are going onto the roadway shoulder. The children can use the high visibility crosswalk. Additionally, we have uh, parking that's nearby for um, the parents, so it's convenient from that standpoint. Our town traffic engineer has also reviewed this location, um, and he is here tonight and can give you a couple of his comments, but he has also found it to be a safe and appropriate location for a bus stop. Okay, I, I appreciate the answer relative to that particular location. Can you describe the process for the approval of the bus stop locations, and is there a document or some place we can look to that lists the complete list of bus stops that have been reviewed by Parks and Public Works and that are deemed to be acceptable from a safety perspective? Yeah, Jesse Poo, Town Traffic Engineer. Yes, I have requested a, a list of a tra uh, bus stops and the bus routes from the school, and I reviewed the bus stops and found them uh, safe and uh, um, and uh, allow them to continue using those bus stops. Is there a place that people could look from the public because this is a very visible um, project in CUP for the entire town? Is there a place that we could look to determine what those stops are? Um, yeah, there's the, it's uh, via email communication. Um, I requested, they supplied it, and I reviewed uh, the location in the uh, in the field, and um, and agreed those agreed with them. Those are safe locations. And so, what we can do uh, to jump in here um, is we can get a copy of that list that the town engineer has reviewed, place that in the planning file, so that people. Uh, can have access to that list, and as that list, it, should it evolve or change, or they add or delete bus stops, then we will uh, keep that up to date. Could I further request that that's available to the public? It, it, you the know, planning it, file it, is available to the public. They public. can come down any time between 8 and 1 um, during counter hours and ask for the file, and they can take a look at that. Okay. Vice Chair Kane. This may not go go to the question of, of the CUP per se, but one of the letters we received from the community suggested getting that bus off of Shannon and into the parking lot by the park. I drove in there today, um, one of my visits to the school on this CUP question. It's a one lane parking lot with uh, only one side having parking. But would it be um, a bad idea, would it be unlawful for the bus to pull in there for 10 minutes to load and unload in what would seem to be a much, much safer manner?
the entrance and exit of the parking lot it has a tight turn. Um, and there are also uh, people walking in the bus in the parking lot uh, to have a bus to have a, that size of bus to make that turn into the parking lot may uh, may be a challenge. From what I read, I thought they were smaller buses. Is that wrong? They're real big old school buses. Um, yes, they 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 they're large size. Bus. In any event, it might be worth taking a look at because that sure would solve the problem of Shannon. Um, in coming down Hilo, approaching Shannon, which I think is a is a thoroughfare for the school, the feedback to Shannon, especially when the students are coming out. There's bushes to the right and the left on Hilo as you reach Shannon, and unless you stick your nose out, they really block visibility on oncoming traffic. Um, I don't know if we can trim bushes, but I know there's a series of them there, but would it be in any way feasible to put a stop sign on the intersection of Hilo and Shannon? So that's a two-part question in regards to the bushes. Uh, the, the One of the properties at the corner of Shannon and Hilo is currently in code enforcement, and we are trying to get voluntary compliance to cut those hedges back. If not, we'll have to have the courts allow us to do the cutting of those bushes. And with regards to whether we could make that a four-way stop, I'll ask our traffic engineer, three-way stop or a four-way stop, I'll let our traffic engineer address that issue. It might it might help. Um, do, you want him to, do you want him to address that? Yes, please. Yes, uh, we will review uh, the... Uh, the uh, uh, always stop warrant, see if it meets any of the criteria for uh, always stop. Uh, the reason we review that is so that we don't cause uh, a severe interruption to traffic for all Shannon. Well, that goes to this question then. Has there ever been an accident, um, to the best of your knowledge, in that area specific to children coming and going? Because uh, that, that is a blind, practically a blind entrance onto Shannon where people tend to go just a little bit over the speed limit. To my knowledge, um, I don't think that's a, a, a high accident location. Um, it has never been a uh, intersection, unsafe intersection on our on our uh, on our radar. So um, we, I believe, I have reviewed that intersection uh, accident for our intersection when we reviewed the hedge. Uh, as part of that case, and we we didn't find uh, uh, accident uh, history for that intersection. One more question, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, the limit on the number of trips per day is given as 880. Is that that correct? And one of the uh, community letters said that uh, limit had been exceeded. I think they said many times or a number of times, and yet in going through all the data we've received, I didn't find any daily trips even approaching that number. Do you have any knowledge of the 880 being exceeded? No. We do not, and if the speaker is here this evening, you can ask them. They may be speaking of instances uh, prior to the adoption or around the adoption of the revised conditional use permit, but they could uh, probably provide additional clarification. So you're saying in the past it may have been worse than it is now? Correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the subject of traffic study, or traffic safety, I should say, can we notify the police department to give um, special attention to the Can Kennedy and Shannon areas during commute hours, especially with attention given to driving laws pertaining to buses? We can provide that direction to the chief. That would be helpful uh, based on the letters that we've received. Commissioner O'Donnell? I would like to ask staff, and I'm not sure who the proper person, but paragraph 25 of the uh, CUP uh, says that upon completion of the six month initial review set forth in condition 16, the planning commission shall conduct an annual review. So it's rather critical to figure out when the um, annual review time period commences. So I guess that would commence upon the completion of the six months initial review. So I guess I'm asking what is the date of the completion of the six months annual review? 
you're correct in the uh, Completion was November in November of last year by the council. Um, it was initially the six-month review, um, and I will look to Ms. Puga. She probably has those details right at her fingertips. Um, but the six-month review was to, um, as I recall, occur in September, but we were not able to make that work. That, that's an adequate date for me. In other words, it was November of last year. So the annual review would essentially be November, late October, whatever, of this year. As I understand it, that's what our authority is. We can make an annual review. I recently asked that question, as some people have asked us, well, is this a good time for it? And I guess whether that's a good question or not, our authority, as I understand it, is under 25, which says an annual review commencing with uh, the end of that six-month period. Is that, does anybody have a different understanding? No, that's that's correct. And so every year, actually, going forward, this will come before the planning commission around this time, um, depending on schedules and agendas. And so we will be uh, going through the same exercise each year. And and confirm it has nothing to do with the vesting date of the CUP. That's correct. Any further questions? Seeing none. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Hudes. Yeah, I had a question about the traffic counts, and we received a revised report today, I believe, um, with a correction to the um, traffic counts. And I'm trying to understand, you know, why that is. It looks like a about a 50% error in traffic counts between the document that we received dated October 12th and the one we received today. Why a 50% jump in traffic um, from 396 to 604? So I will give that question to our traffic consultant, um, W. Trans, and we will have um, Nick Bleach discuss this. Thank you, Commissioner, for the question. Um, so for, through review last week when the report was co uh, completed, uh, we noticed an error in the spreadsheet calculations. I had compared. Um, so the census system is on the exit lanes, and we assume one trip in, one trip out. And what we had compared was the you double that to get your total count. It's explained in the report, and it's a standard procedure. Um, I had compared the in trips and the out trips on the video. We had counted both directions. And so there was, I noticed an error there and recalculated the entire spreadsheet and then came up with the new completed numbers, which are uh, from the report from this morning for the desk report. So these are the accurate numbers based on the counts, which are included as appendices uh, for further checks. Um, but these are the updated accurate numbers comparing that uh, that day, Tuesday, the, the 4th of October. So if the error was only in that one day, the other ones are correct? You're correct. Okay. And was that error related to the fact that we're dealing with a short day on the 4th? Because it says the on October 4th, there are only 10-hour exit from 7 to 5 p.m. due it to a technical issue. Is that related, or is that a separate issue with the report? So that's a separate issue with the report. That's a, the technical issue is with the, the count system, the video count system. Um, we, are, we were missing the 5 to 7 p.m. day set. So... Because of that, there were trips that may have entered the campus and been counted in the video counts before 5 p.m. Um, that would be then included in the count. So I used only the exit counts because they're counted in both directions to do a direct comparison on that one day for 10 hours. Since you're comparing 10 hours of video counts to 10 hours of census counts for the same direction of travel. And then doubling those, assuming one trip in, one trip out. Okay, and then another question on the acceptable margin of error. Um, it says that the acceptable margin of error is uh, less than 5%, correct? And is that, how do we interpret that to be a sum of those days rather, or an average of those days rather than just exceeding 5%, meaning that it looks to me like the counts on the fourth and the fifth exceed the margin of error. Well, my name is Mark Spencer. I'm principal with W Trans, overseeing this work on behalf of our firm and on behalf of the town. Uh, with respect to the 5% error, that was put in because there's a, 
in the CUP, it's put in, because there's, if you have different count systems, whether you count by hand, using video cameras and then by hand, or a, a mechanical system, or a tube system, such as the backup system, um, you're not going to get exactly the same result. So generally, things are going to vary approximately 5% across different systems. There could be any number of reasons for that, from, from human error to electronic pulses and glitches in the uh, electronic systems, but you want to keep it within 5% to say this is the range that we're dealing with. Also, it falls within the normal da daily variation of, of traffic that you might see. So 5% in terms of engineering judgment is considered acceptable. When we look at the report that you have in front of you and you see that uh, there's two days that have slightly over 5%, another day which is less, we average those. Uh, to take a look at it, we're doing a three-day average of apples to apples, trying to compare the different systems to see how much they compare to one another. We don't expect them to be exactly the same or the same percentages, but on an average, you can see there's less than a 5% variation between them. So you can have a day that's a little above. If there's something that's wildly different, then obviously we, re we would report that. That's what our job is. But we feel averaging them actually makes sense from an engineering judgment perspective because we are looking at a three-day count and a three-day total um, of the system itself, and that's, that's well within sort of what we consider an engineering data collection tolerance. One, one more question, if I may. The, um, in order to exceed the uh, maximum permitted, what percentage error would you have on the roughly 800 trips? In other words, so, so how, much, how much above the 5% would we have to get to before we hit the 880? Yes. I'm not sure. I mean, we're, we're pretty well under the 880 as a total. Okay. Um, so I'd have, to, I'd have to take a look. But I, I think there's, it, it's also that it's not necessarily the difference between the two systems, which is what the 5% variation is representing. That's the difference between two count systems. It's how much over and above any one count system that we would actually have to look at to get to that 880 number. That would be 10%, wouldn't it? What was the maximum total we counted? If you assume 800 trips, then yes, 10%. 10% over 880, yeah. Okay, thank you. Over 800. Commissioner Hansen? Um, I had a couple more questions for staff. Um, on condition 19, the traffic count monitoring, um, it says the um, that the traffic count monitoring will be done every semester. And I'm wondering, since the date of the initial approval was November of 2015, why we don't have any data from spring 2016. Uh, the school didn't invest the CUP until this summer, so they weren't subject to the conditions for this past spring semester. That doesn't seem to follow the logic of the annual review since the approval was given on November of 2015 till now, and and if they chose not to vest it, they they it doesn't make sense that that completes a year. I'm having a hard time understanding that because if if the approval was the November of 2015, that's when the clock should be starting till now for a year, and it shouldn't matter what the vesting date was because you just told us that a few minutes ago. So I'm just trying to understand why that would be. So, as the condition reads, upon the completion of the six-month review, which happened last November, then the Planning Commission will conduct, conduct annual reviews. So, I believe, as also is stated in the report, um, when the census data was reviewed for the spring up until the vesting of the uh, existing CUP, they had a different set of metrics that they had to comply with from a trip count perspective. Um, and I would look to Ms. Puga to confirm that um, they were not above those numbers during that time frame as well. I didn't receive any information from our Parks and Public Works Department that they were out of compliance, but they can respond with additional information. Um, okay, I have, a, um, I have an additional question, or should I wait to hear the response on I, I would suggest we hear from the applicant and, and then do our questions. Okay. Uh, unless, unless you feel it is very pertinent right now, go ahead. I can wait. Okay. Is it following along the same line of questioning? Because there's another question I have about the CUP and the timing. Okay. But, um, why, why I, can ask the, I can ask the applicant. Okay. Let's get the applicants up here. Um, 
I'm going to call the applicants up to the podium. You'll have 10 minutes to address us. And I have speaker cards from Chuck Hammers and Mark Silver. Good evening, Chair Bottomy and uh, Commissioners. My name is Chuck Hammers, and I'm the chair of the board of Hillbrook School. And uh, beside me is Mark Silver, who's the head of school. Um, I want to start off by thanking you for your time tonight. I know this is a special meeting. I know this has been a big year. I'm a resident here, and um, I appreciate your time. Um, by having the meeting now and staying on this schedule for our annual compliance meetings, um, it's very helpful for us because this will give us a clear direction of our enrollment, and our enrollment season starts in two weeks, so um, thank you again for meeting early. Um, I'd like to start off with a bit of background of our CUP, uh, although I know a lot of you know it. In February uh, 2012, we applied to change our CUP to add 99 students. At the time, the school was limited to 315 students, which often left a number of classrooms short of students. We also wanted to add a third section of 6th through 8th graders, which will allow more classroom options for our middle school kids. This led to us asking for the 99 more students. And in October of 2014, the Planning Commission approved our new CUP with 414 students. Uh, the Commission, in that approval, recommended that we spread the 99 students over three years, or 33 students per year. Six months later, in March of 2015, the Town Council approved our new CUP in its final version. The final version included this three-year ramp-up. Condition 15 clearly states that the school can enroll up to 33 more students in each of the next two school years. Um, as you heard, we were given the approval last November 3rd to add the 33 students, and then we added those uh, we added 23 of them on August uh, 31st. That was our first day of school. So as the town told us that the first day that a student crossed the line and went above 315 students, that would be the day that that vested. Um, the right was also coupled with a very specific contingency. The school must be in compliance with its traffic requirements. This is important. The reason it is contingent only upon the traffic requirement is that in reality what matters to the neighborhood is the number of cars, not as much the number of students. So we're looking at this as being judged not just on seven weeks of traffic, but in our entire last year also. Um, we're really proud of what we've done with our traffic. And I think one of you asked about, you know, what about last year? We had four days over 880, and we were allowed 10. So we were, we were um, well under our total. We have 10 days that we can go up to 960, and we were under those on those four days. Um, as you saw, we, March 17th was the date of our um, CUP passing, and then November 3rd, we had our six-month review. And then here we are tonight for our 12-month review. Um, why is this important to the school? This is our enrollment schedule. So in two weeks, we've got our open house, and, and it's um, really critical. It's on the same weekend every year, and all the other private schools take different weekends. And you schedule it because you don't want some of the people looking at your school and not being able to go to the other school and vice versa. So we kind of all divvy up the weekends. And then you can see it happens pretty quickly. We start getting decisions out in December. And then we're fully enrolled by March of what's going to happen the following year. So in this year, when we sent our enrollment letters out and we started getting them back in March, we knew that we were going to enroll over our 315, and we were very open and public that, yes, we are going to vest it, but we couldn't actually vest until the day that first student came in, and just by the per, uh, rules of the CUP. Um, and then... This is our first ongoing compliance meeting, which is really different than the judge of whether we should get our next 33 students. Um, you know, part of the CUP was we're going to come back to you every year. We've been in this town for 80 years, and we're going to keep coming back to you for the next 80, and you get to judge us, and we will look forward to that. We're, we are uh, proud of where we ended up with the CUP, and we're proud of our traffic, and um, uh, we think we've done a good job. I'd like to have Mark come up right now and talk a little bit about the traffic and, and things we've done. Thanks, Jack. Um, so 
we just want to talk a little bit about how have we lowered traffic. And um, actually, a lot of these things you heard back when we first um, approached you, and we talked about uh, increasing our enrollment. And I'm proud, and, and I think our community is proud, that we have continued to get better and better. Um, and so, um, you know, what do we do? We have a very clear expectation. We have a transportation demand management plan, which asks that every student bike, walk, carpool, or take the shuttle to school. The biggest shift that we've seen over the last three to four years has been in the shuttle. So we have over 150 students every day coming and going from school on our shuttles or our buses. Um, this year we added a fourth shuttle because it was so popular. We have, there's a, a stop out near the uh, Manresa Bread that we have 40 to 50 kids every morning getting on at that stop. That's keeping all of those cars from driving across the highway and getting in the, you know, the, the traffic where we have over by all of our schools. Um, we have a very active carpool program, including online connections that, that uh, parents can make. Um, a transportation coordinator, Nicole Kabarlak, who's here tonight, um, who you know, spends a lot of time working with families and working with um, Safe Routes to Schools and working with our community to help us meet these uh, requirements. Um, and then we have things like Marching Mondays. And so uh, we'll, we'll celebrate on Mondays and get a lot of students walking to and from school on those days. Um, and, just, and, and we have seen over the last few years that that's led to more students walking. Um, you know, once parents try it and kids try it a couple of times, they come back and try it some more. Uh, we also have a traffic and safety monitor, and, and this person works with all of the people in our community, not just Hillbrook students. Um, one of the wonderful things over the last few years that's happened, and Chuck walks to school a lot, I walk to school with my children a number of days, is we're passing families from other schools as we're walking to and from school, and we're saying hi to people, and we're, and we're really you know, building those connections with the neighborhood. Um, our traffic person is, an, is a big part of that. He's out there every morning making sure that all students are safe as they're walking or biking to schools. Uh, Safe Routes to Schools, we are very proud you know, uh, to be a part of Safe Routes to School. And tomorrow night, I know they're going to talk to the town council, but we just created a new nonprofit. And I'm on the board of that nonprofit, the Safe Routes to School nonprofit. And Hillbrook, the uh, public, public school elementary district, the high school, and the town of Los Gatos, those four organizations got together to make this nonprofit. We are very serious about working with the town of Los Gatos to have successful transportation demand management plans at all of our schools. Um, and it's something that's important to me, and, and I'm really proud to be part of that group that is helping to drive that process forward. Um, and then this year, something new that we've also tried is working with our employees. And so, um, you know, we've always had, a, every organization has an employee benefit around carpooling. It's a state mandate. But we upped the ante on that this year. We increased the amount that we're paying employees to carpool or to take alternative measures to get to school. And we've really been working. And again, you know, one of the things we're, you know, t educators, it's really hard to live in this area to start with. And so one of these things, it's a great way for us to get a little more money in our employees' pockets. But it's also, of course, a great way for us to meet the demands of the CUP. And so, you know, that's been a, that's been a very successful thing. The other thing we tried out this year are bikes. And so, for example, um, you'll see, you know, see some of our employees biking around campus. And some of our employees also kind of, you know, will bike down into a, to, to, to Pete's to get a cup of coffee now instead of driving back and forth in the middle of the day. You know, a little way to, to be green and a little way to, to cut down on the traffic in the neighborhood. So what do the numbers say? Um, you know, we're very proud, and I don't know if you can, we didn't send this in, but I don't know if you can see this very well. But if you look, the, on the far left is 2013, and then on the far right is this year, 2016. Um, the lower bars are exits, and then the, the big bars overall. And as a reminder, we have a counter that marks exits, and so you double the counts. So we, it was around 17,000, 17,500 in 2013. 2016 is the lowest number yet. It's just over 14,000 cars. That's less than September of 2015. So we've added 25 students, 20, uh, 26 students now. We've added a, a few more students since the first day of school. We are down from our traffic year over year. And if you go back three years, it's you know 3,000 plus cars less than traffic was back in 2013. So we're very proud of the efforts we're making to limit the traffic. Um, and then finally, I know that you know the broader question about our compliance with the CUP. Um, you know, we're doing everything that we can to stay in compliance. We've posted the exception days on August 1st. We reorganized our athletic program um, so that we uh, one of the new conditions limits the number of days that we can have athletic competitions. So we've reorganized that program so that we're meeting that expectation. Uh, as I've said already, we have a robust and mandatory traffic demand management plan. Um, we continue to work with um, the Los Gatos Parks and Public Works Department to ensure approval of bus stops. 
um, uh, you know, we've had uh, uh, Calipo and the uh, police officers, people like that, come out and look at those stops to make sure they're safe. Um, and then, of course, we've only we've enrolled less than 348 students. So, um, thank you um, for for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Silvers and Mr. Hammers. We have questions for you, uh, Vice Chair Kane, followed by Commissioner Hansen. The TDM um, the TDM plan seems to have had an, an advantageous effect, um, but it also seemed to me that it was internal. This is what you're telling your this is what you're telling your people. Do you have an outreach where you go to the neighbors and say, "How's it working?" Good, good question. So, you know, we're very active members of Safe Routes to Schools, um, and those are public meetings that, you know, the neighborhood is very involved with. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for people to offer feedback on traffic around the neighborhood and through the schools. We also send out regular um, newsletters, and we're always inviting people to reach out. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of having Nicole Kabarlock play her new role is that we now have a designated person to, um, you know, to help respond to those concerns, and of course, I'm also always available to respond if there, somebody wants to speak with me directly. I guess what I'm talking about is I drove the neighborhood, all the side streets and cul-de-sacs, and do you have a program specifically to go see those people about how you're doing? I have maybe um, seven different authors, maybe eight, who've expressed their concerns, and there's a lot of passion in their concerns. And I was wondering why there wasn't more of them. And I'm wondering if you've got a program to address your neighbors and give them a hotline or something, um, not not all the other stuff, but specific to your immediate neighbors yes, on so all those little tiny narrow streets. Do you reach out to them? We do reach out to all of the neighbors, um, and we and we do have a, a way for people to contact us directly if they have direct concerns. I also know that I've met with a number of neighbors who've been very appreciative of the efforts we've made. Um, you know, and which I think is why you see fewer people here tonight from both, you know, both Hillbrook and neighbors. One other question. Three years ago when we were first One more question. You mentioned that you've been up there for 80 years. Now, I knew there was a school there in 1936. Was that Hillbrook? 1935, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 81 years. You're dating yourself there, <laughs> Vice Chair Kane. <laughs> I was not in the first graduating class. <laughs> <and> <laughs> You've been up there for 80 years. Um, I didn't know that was you back in 36. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen, followed by Commissioner Hudis. Um, I had a couple of questions. On the traffic demand management plan, for, first I'd like to say I, I was in my former role on the Transportation and Parking Commission. I was involved with Safe at the School, and I, I think what Hillbrook is doing to try and manage traffic is great. Um, but to be transparent to our community, the condition 18 on the traffic demand management plan does not require you to share the plan, but I, I wonder with the number of opposition letters that we've got, if you wouldn't be willing to share the traffic demand management plan with the public, that way they, it would be clear what you're trying to do. Um, because some of the letters are, are, are basically saying all you're doing is displacing traffic from Marchmont to other streets in Los Gatos where there's residences. and, and sure. Again, if you were transparent about the process and willing to share that information, you know that might help to address some of the concerns. So, are you willing to share that? I think we're trying to be as transparent as possible. So, I, you know, I welcome the suggestions or feedback on how we can make that plan more transparent. I think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. the dates that you're going to exceed the enrollment online. You know, maybe you could make a copy of it online on your website or something that people could look at it. Um, second question. Um, the question I asked staff about traffic count monitoring, in your own presentation, you said the year period is from October 2015 to October 2016. And so would you be willing to share the traffic counts? Because all we got was three days of data in October of this year. and All on the town website. All, okay, all of our data for the last year, actually the longer than that, since the March of 2015 is all on, all public data on the website. But I, I guess we don't have the process of WTRANS doing their manual count in conjunction with it. Just, but you have your data on the website. Yeah, there was a day last spring, I believe, as under the old CUP where there was a count. Um, I don't believe it was done by WTRANS. It was done by the other, I, tra I don't remember the name of the other company that does traffic. Um, 
So I, I don't know that they can speak to that. But. Okay, we can come back to that. Um, the Again, the, back to the timing of this. Um, in your own letter to us, um, you talked about complying with the summer session in, in 2017. Um, but the conditions of approval um, ask you to um, comply with those terms. Um, if I'm looking at the timing of it, you didn't vest until August, which our staff had said. But in spirit, if you're looking at this from a year perspective, um, the summer session, it didn't look like you were in compliance for 2016. Is that a correct statement? Yeah. So, so the, if the, the if the vesting had been so, completed. So again, our imp my understanding all along was that we could not vest until August of 2016. So, so in other words, we we had the approval last November, but it was pretty clearly created to delay our vesting until the start of this school year. So from my understanding, was that was the earliest possible day that we could vest. The so it has to be not when a person you know, signs up and enrolls and pays. It has to be when they actually show up at school. Yes. So so, so we had enrolled them as, I mean, and we, and just the way the CUP was written, we had enrolled them or started to enroll them, right, as of March. It had taken, you know, all the things you do to enroll somebody in a school, but technically it doesn't vest until the day they actually arrive. But, but I do want to speak to in terms of, so the summer, so we had a program called Breakthrough Silicon Valley, um, which worked with low-income students and which we've supported for six plus years on our, six years, I guess, on our campus. And so when we learned that we couldn't vest until August of 2016, our decision was to serve them one more time. Um, you know, it's a program that as a school, we've donated money to the program. We work really closely with them and they won't be there in future summers because of the way the conditions are written. written. But, um, you know, we felt it was important to try to honor that commitment as long as we could. Okay, that makes sense. Um, final question. Um, you have a list of dates in your letter of, for the exceptions, um, but I, when you were showing your list of events, I didn't see the open house on November 3rd on your list that was in your letter. Is that not a day you need an exception for? I mean, because it's a normal school day, isn't it? It's a, it's a Saturday. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's inside the, oh, the date may be wrong. It's November 5th. Okay, yeah, because it said November sorry. 3rd, and it's, it's, it's I was Saturday, looking at this calendar as the it's a Thursday. It's Saturday, November 5th, and it, it's it's in the CUP. It's the, it's one of the few days that we can use the campus on a Saturday. Okay, and you don't have to notice it, it you know, on. It, it, it won't be one of those days where we're going right. to be over 880 cars. Okay. Any further questions, Commissioner Hudis? Um, my question was about the summer session, and. Uh, so what was the number of um, students that you had during the summer and how many are allowed in the CUP going forward? So I think the number going forward is 150. Um, I actually, I don't believe we were much above that. We were around that number. The, the issue that we have is the time. So, so the, the way the new conditions are written, we can only be on campus from 9 till 1 or 8 till 1. I, I should know that, but I don't remember the exact hours. But, but so it's a half day. And so the program, Break the Silicon Valley, was a full day program. And so that was, that's the reason why that we decided to do that. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I will now invite comments from members of the public. I have three speaker cards. Our first speaker is Barbara Dodson. I will have four speaker cards. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Barbara Dotson. I live on Marchmont Drive. First off, I'd like to thank Hillbrook School and Hillbrook parents for the good job they've done in reducing traffic on Marchmont Drive. Last year and this September, Hillbrook definitely met the traffic limits of the CUP. I have no issue with the current level of traffic on my street. And I am hopeful that Hillbrook will comply with the conditions in the new CUP going forward and will be able to increase its enrollment again. Um, so I have to stop in my, in my talk and say that I find it quite ridiculous that we would be talking about compliance. <laughs> the date of the compliance for a, for a CUP seems to me to be the date when that CUP is accepted. I don't know how we can evaluate a CUP based on a time when it wasn't even in force. So I have a real problem with that. 
I, I don't see how legal can justify that at all. I really question that. CUPs have been accepted. You just have to accept a CUP, in my understanding. So I have two issues to raise here. One is the timing of this review. The second is the fact that Hilbert has not been in compliance with the new CUP for a full year, as would be required in an annual review. Here's my question. If a CUP has been in effect for just over a month, should that CUP be evaluated as if it's been effect, in effect for a year? Since the annual review is meant to check on compliance with the new CUP, it should be conducted based on when the new CUP went into effect. That would mean the review which should happen quite a while into the future, not six weeks after vesting. It seems to me that the clock should start ticking on compliance with a permit on the date that that permit goes into effect. However, if you decide to use data from the last year instead of just the September data, Hillbrook will not have complied with the new CUP for a full year. Please look at the items in green. In this letter of justification to you, Hillbrook states, we feel Hillbrook is fully in compliance with the new CUP. Yet just below that, we see this. We should also note that starting during September 2017, we will reduce our summer programs. Here, Hillbrook freely admits that it was out of compliance. Condition 11 in the new CUP tells Hillbrook to end summer programs by 1 p.m. and to have programs for only three, uh, six weeks. <sighs> Hillbrook also didn't meet condition five, which states it can host on-campus sports events no more than three days a week. <sighs> During many weeks last year, Hillbrook hosted events with other schools on four weekdays, and only two events per week can be outdoors, yet this month, October, this month, three outdoor events are scheduled for one week. This review and the second annual review are the only safeguards neighbors have against dramatic traffic increases that could come with enrollment increases. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dodson. Any questions from commissioners for Ms. Dodson? Uh, stay there. Vice Chair Kane has a question. Well, first I want to thank you for your letter of October 10, many good points. I'd like to understand better what you said when the bell rang, that there had been three events scheduled for outdoors during, what, October? Okay, this October, we just looked on the, uh, the current uh, uh, schedule, and Hilbrook is supposed to be, they had vested, so then they're supposed to comply with all the elements of the CUP, which would mean that they're only allowed two outdoor events per week. And yet this very month, they have three outdoor events scheduled. So I, I can't see that they are in compliance when they already have a plan to violate the CUP. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen? And just to confirm, this is October 2016, so this is next week. Yeah. Yes? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dodson. Our next speaker is Jill Fordyce. And if you could please state your name for the record, I may have mispronounced it, so you can correct me if necessary. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Jill Fordyce. I live at 191 Longmeadow. Um, so where I live in the court of Longmeadow, I'm one lot over from the back lot at Hillbrook. So our main concern is the summer program and outdoor events there. As before the, the buses and carpooling started, we didn't actually experience the, travel, the traffic problems on Longmeadow. Um, my concern, as Barbara shared also, is I'm not sure what, I'm not sure why we're doing this now. I just experienced a typical Hillbrook summer with um, the six weeks of all day breakthrough Silicon Valley and the June to August summer school or summer at Hillbrook program um, that was not what is in compliance with the CUP, and that's when you know, when they put this up there showing we're in full compliance with the CUP, I thought, well, but where's the summer program? And, and then they came up and explained that because it hadn't vested yet and they hadn't had the opportunity to vest it yet, that they didn't consider that as part of compliance, I guess, is a way of saying it. So I'm just not sure how it can be both ways. Like, how do we assess compliance when this big component wasn't part of it yet? So it's either a timing issue or a non-compliance issue. Um, it's a little confusing to me, and I'm sorry if I've confused you. <laughs> um, the second issue I want to talk about is the bus stops. They have affected us. 
Um, the Shannon Road one, I'm surprised it has as much talk about it uh, more so than Kennedy because the Kennedy Road one, to me, is much worse. I hit Shannon in the afternoon. The parents are on the side of the road. There is a bus stop. There's usually not much delay. The Kennedy in the morning, if you leave Longmeadow to Kennedy around 7.50 a.m. or after, you're going to get a bus or two that stops in the middle of the road on Kennedy, put stop signs up so it stops two lanes of traffic, which there are only two lanes of traffic. And um, it can be up to a five-minute wait at a light that's already sometimes up to five minutes, um, which then creates people cutting the back way down Gem or I guess it's Vista del Monte maybe, um, to get to Las Gatas High or town. So um, also, as you probably know, Kennedy has no sidewalks. It's narrow, and you know it's already not a great place for that type of situation to exist. Um, those are the main issues I wanted to talk about, and if anyone has any questions. Any questions for Ms. Fordyce? Commissioner Hansen. Um, you mentioned in the morning. Is it also an issue in the afternoon as well? Uh, not that I've experienced on Kennedy. I, I see Shannon in the afternoon. I don't. Maybe that's just my travel. Well, probably because people are coming out to go to Los Gatos Boulevard versus coming back in. Yeah. You know, and, and I know your intersection very well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patty Elliott. Good evening. I'm Patty Elliott. I live on Marchmont Drive. Um, initially, I was going to apologize for giving you a letter um, just before the meeting began in which I um, analyzed a number of issues that I see in the traffic report that was published on Friday. Um, what I didn't realize is that there's been some significant changes to that traffic report in a, uh, another desk item that um, I just uh, now saw. So. My overhead is, is out of date um, based on what the new information is that came forward. Um, what the new information that came forward reflects, though, is that the system for counting traffic that Hillbrook has in place is not reliable. In the three days that were tested uh, by the video counts, by the traffic consultant, two of those three days come in with an error over 5%. And if it was sometimes um, undercounting and sometimes overcounting, I guess maybe that wouldn't be so big a problem. But the fact of the matter is that the system that Hillbrook has in place undercounts daily trips every single day. 100% of the time, the system has been tested it is undercounting vehicles. And again, the numbers I have here are uh, in terms of the percentage discrepancies and the undercounts um, are actually less than, than what now uh, you have in your corrected report from the consultant. Um, the town <laughs> wants to use an average of the undercounting to somehow try to minimize it to make it seem like it's not as bad. But the fact of the matter is that the CUP does not permit that. Uh, the CUP very clearly states that anything over a 5% discrepancy of undercount is a fail. It's not acceptable. You can't minimize those failed undercounts by averaging some lesser days that may be less than 5% undercounting. Um, so I 100% agree with everything the other speaker said. This is, this is uh, not the appropriate time to be evaluating allowing Hillbrook an additional increase. But on top of that, what needs to have significant reevaluation is the system that Hillbrook has put in place 
because it is simply not adequate. It is not reliable. And the entire basis for this CUP is so uh, dependent on those numbers being accurate. Thank you. Commissioner Hudas, followed by Vice Chair Kane. Um, I understand your point, and I'm sympathetic to the issues with the um, counting errors. Um, however, I, I'm just looking at the numbers, the total numbers, and even if there were more than a 10% error rate, they still would not exceed the maximum. Is that correct? Um, I don't know all the math off the top of my head. I would, I would defer to you on that. However, um, the, the, the concern that I have is, is that right now um, Hillbrook hasn't even admitted the total of the 33 they're entitled to. Um, so we're, we're having, um, it's going to get worse as they increase their enrollment. There's no question about that. Um, so before we get to the point where it gets worse and where we're in danger of having um, these these numbers that are inaccurate and in fact we the neighbors experience traffic over 880 a day but it's not being reported um, we need to have this system corrected we need to have an accurate reliable system um, do it require that the school do that now and test later in the year to confirm that the, there's a more reliable system before we allow additional enrollment increases. This, the, the way the system is set up now, it's, it's doomed to failure. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe one more question. Uh, go with, ahead. With regard to um, traffic, you live nearby. Have you seen a reduction in traffic um, in any way uh, similar to the chart that the um, applicant provided? I live right on Marchmont Drive on the hill leading up to the school. And yes, over the last couple of years, I have seen a decrease um, in the daily traffic on Marchmont. Part of that, I think, is, is due to the bus, uh, the bus um, program and the carpool program, which I think they have been very successful in doing. Um, so yes, I've seen an improvement in my street. I've heard from neighbors who are further away, people who live around Shady View, for instance, people who live on Kennedy, uh, people who live on Jem and Filmer, and the areas where um, parents will drop off children for the bus stops, or they drop, or they pull up to, to each other, then they get into each other's cars for a, you know, a, a brief carpool. I've heard from neighbors there. Um, that that things aren't as good and and that in fact it's it's yeah. worse for them because this is happening now now you know where they are yeah thank you and I will follow up with staff on uh, complaints from other areas that others that you're not able to personally observe. I don't see thank it. you thank you miss Elliott further questions vice chair Kane <laughs> It seems to me you've got something of a deal breaker if what you're saying is true. So how do I know what you're saying is true? I mean, how do you accurately say they undercount every single day? How do you know they go over 880 many of those days? Let, That's let very me, important. Yes, let me correct that. I'm not saying that they are currently going over 880 every day. I don't think they are going over 880 every day. What I'm saying is that the counting mechanism they have in place every single day, and it's only been six days over in, in 2015 and again in 2016, but every single day the town has done a video count, a visual count to test these electronic systems. It turns out that the electronic systems are significantly undercounting. And I don't know why that's true. I don't know if the town staff knows why that's true. Um, I don't know if Hillbrook know, knows why that's true. What I do know, though, is that the CUP, in addition to the um, sensors that were embedded and that are being tested as against the video um, review by the consultant, the new CUP required Hillbrook to install tube counts. 
which would, um, which would count both the entering and the exiting traffic, as opposed to the sensors, which only count the, uh, the exiting traffic. And the tube count expressly in the CUP is supposed to be the backup data in order to confirm what these sensors are telling us. Well, the consultants are telling us that the sensors aren't being accurate. And, and by a measure of over 5% on these last two days that were tested. So where is the tube count data? That's supposed to be the backup confirmation, clarification data that is to be used. Um, and I don't see that anywhere um, except for one day they say, well, we tested it on September 24th and this is what we found. But that doesn't tell us what happened, um, tube count versus, versus um, the, the census data. Um, and, you know, again, I mean, the, the, if, we're, if we're being asked as a community to rely on something that we know already is undercounting by over 5% routinely, this is just not going to work. The CUP itself says that a 5% undercount is a fail. And once we get closer and closer to that 880 number, and I guarantee you we will with increased enrollment, it's, it's going to be a big problem. This is a Q&A period. So my question has been answered some time back, and Sorry. I'm not sure what the answer was. I want to know how you know that they undercount every single day and you say over 5%, and the averages that I'm looking at are 4.6 and 4.2, and what the gentleman said earlier, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that 5% is a presumed acceptable standard of deviation based on many, 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 many experiences. Let me flip the coin the other way. How does a video system work? They take pictures and somebody counts them later? That's my understanding. You're not going to like me if I say this, but maybe they're overcounting. I mean, that's why they use averages. Well, you know, the, to, to, to but, try but and to try and all, work with out. With all the, due respect, the, the CUP does not allow for the use of averages when it comes to testing the systems, and when it comes to uh, numbers which reflect that the systems are undercounting by five percent. The five percent is where it becomes. Untenable. Again, I want to thank you for the, the q and I, I need to know how we know that they undercount every single day. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Elliott? I, I, can, I can answer that. If, I, I'll try one more time if, if you're not sure. Would you I'd like another it. shot at it? Uh, yes, try one more time. Okay. Um, so in, and again, this, is, this has been superseded by um, at least the bottom part has been superseded by the new documentation from the consultant. So the video every day is higher than the census count every day that has been tested. That's how I, that's how I, that's what I base that on. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim. I'm sorry, Vice when, Chair When Kane? would it be appropriate to ask a question to staff afterwards? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. Kim Vryzen, Vrygen? <laughs> Hello. My name is Kim Bryan. <laughs> I'm just teasing. And I live at 268 Marchmont Drive. I want to thank the commission and staff for organizing this yearly review of the Hillbrook CUP. The good news is that traffic in the neighborhood continues to be reasonable. As the September traffic data showed, Hillbrook traffic counts remain below the 880 allowed, even with the new students accepted this fall. For that, I commend the Hillbrook parents and staff. I've seen some drop-offs in parking in the neighborhood, but think that this is parents making bad choices and not behavior encouraged by the school. I've also seen Hillbrook self-policing and asking parents not to park in the neighborhood. All in all, I'm pleased with how the traffic levels selected by town council continue to provide a safe environment for children to walk and bike to school and maintain the quality of the neighborhood. That said, I still think it's early to increase enrollment counts again. 
When town council adopted the Hillbrook CUP, I understood that the staggered enrollment increase, I understood the staggered enrollment increase to be dependent on successful traffic counts. I anticipated that the first round of students would be accepted, traffic would be monitored, and then further increases would be discussed. I did not anticipate a further increase one month after the CUP was accepted and additional students were added. When students were added, I accepted, expected an analysis of the impact that the additional students had had on the traffic. So, for example, now that we've added 8% of students, I would expect to know what percentage has the traffic changed. And I know that the numbers so far have been great, and we hope that will continue. But I don't see how we know that to be a fact after only one month. Uh, and then, just because I'm really a numbers geek, <laughs> um, the numbers that we were given in the new, the new number we were given today I don't think is correct. If you divide 604 by 568, I believe this is actually a 6.34% difference. So I think there is actually a, quite a large delta between the video and the census, which is another thing that the neighbors have said, as you've heard. We um, would like to feel pretty confident in as we go forward. Because I do think um, that right now the traffic numbers are great and there's plenty of room, and so whatever we decide this year, but if we move forward on this schedule, there'll have been 99 students added in a 14-month time period if we gave them all the students, they, the maximum number of students both now and next year. And that just seems like a really short period of time to know that the traffic counts. About. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right, I will now invite uh, the applicants back up to the podium for five minutes to add uh, any, oh, I'm sorry, yes, uh, come forward. All right, uh, Vlada Herman. Good evening, thank you for your time and your service. My name's Vlado Herman, I've lived in Los Gatos for well, close to 15 years on near St. Mary's, and we love St. Mary's. We have a lot of traffic, but we know it's for a good cause. Um, I have two children at Hillbrook, a fifth grader and a third grader, Sarah and David. They asked me where I was going tonight because I couldn't play at Bachman Park with them, uh, flag football. I said, I'm, I'm coming to the town council to talk about our traffic and our CUP. They know very well about what we went through. They were actually here for a few of the hearings and for the final town council meeting. Um, they asked me to tell our friends on Marchmont, I hope you guys are happy that we're taking the bus and we're carpooling because they really are trying and they really want to bring us together. I think I actually spent the week on my break from work. I was reviewing the town council deliberations and they're long and there are a lot of testimony and a lot of emotion. Um, but in the end, it's children, our children. We talk about all these numbers and data. I'm a data guy too, but behind those numbers are, are wonderful children who live by principles of be your best and be kind. Um, and one of our communications norm is assume goodwill. And I, I really try its hard sometimes in these, in these forums, but I do assume goodwill. I know they, please, please they're, trying to to <laughs> they're trying to protect their areas, and I understand that. Um, but I, in the, we didn't mention, though, that there were these traffic um, discrepancies during the town council uh, hearings. And when the 880 was set, if I remember um, from the recordings, that number 880 was set based on knowing that there was a discrepancy. And there always is going to be a discrepancy when you have different varying measures. Um, but most importantly, the children don't matter. It's traffic. And if we exceed our traffic, we pay very big fines. And that was a very big component of the town council deliberations when planning commission sent it over. Um, I am on the Finance Committee of Hillbrook, and believe me, I could never have us go over 880 because we pay very big fines to the town. It would be great for the town. It would be a very good community benefit. You can use it for wonderful things. But in the end, we would never allow an additional student if it would take us over 880. And I think that's really the, the important thing here, and we are trying, and we are doing our best and we're not trying to deceive the system, game the system. We're trying to be above board, and that's all we're trying to do. Um, I hope I can go home tonight and tell the kids we've done our best and the Planning Commission accepted what we've been doing and approved our 33. Thank you very much. 
Vlado, I have a question for you. Can you refresh our memory on what the fines are, should you exceed the count? <sighs> Maybe Chuck can come <laughs> up. He's probably been studying this clearly. I know the, the large numbers. He can go through the calculations. All right, it's, Mr. Um, it's $1,000 for the instance and then $100 for each car over. And then if you are a second month in a row, then it goes to, I think it's 500 and um, it ramps up. The final one is, is 10 times. So if you do it three months in a row. We don't ever expect to get past the first one. That's why we know the first one so well. Okay. And may I ask the cost of your annual tuition? Is that appropriate? It's uh, 31000 okay. Thank you. Any further questions? See none. Thank you. I'm sorry. Was he a speaker or was that their rebuttal? That, that was a question he was answering, a question okay, that I had you. for them. So thank you. Uh, all right. So we have uh, five minutes now uh, remaining for both of you. That was, that was a question I wanted answered, but now you have five minutes to uh, add any further comments about your application. So we don't have anything actually prepared for five minutes, but I would like to go back to um, Commissioner Kane mentioned Hilo and Shannon. I live on Shannon a block down from there. And I know the bush really well because we walk our kids around the bush. And um, this last year, one of the great things between Safe Routes and the town, when they redid Shannon, they drew the lines in another foot or foot and a half, and it slowed traffic down, which was fabulous. And it gave more walking and bicycling room. And the stripe that describes that as it goes around Hilo actually tucks in onto Hilo, and if that stripe came out a little bit wider, it would encourage the cars to go around that bush. So if you can't get the bush down, if you restripe probably 10 or 15 feet just onto Hilo and then come back in, I think it'll keep the cars, because it truly is an unsafe spot where the kids turn that corner, but I did want to address that. So, thank you. All right, any further questions? Seeing a yes, Vice Chair Kane. So the CUP in the first year allowed you to increase enrollment by 33. Yes. And there's been allegations as to why you would want to increase enrollment at all. Why do you want to increase enrollment? So it's, it's um, twofold. The, the first was we had a number of class of grades that were lower in, in volume, lower in um, number count. So you, ideally we have 40, so two classes of, 40, of 20 each in each grade. So we wanted to fill those. And that's kind of what happened with us increasing, I think, what did we do, 26 this year. 23, the report says. It was 23, maybe. and we've added three, I think, since, we've, uh, since that report came out. Thank you. And then next year, the idea is to add a third section of sixth grade. So... Once you get to 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, the kids need more options. They start diverging in what they do. Some want to do more music. Some want to do more art. So by adding that third section of, of another 18 to 20 kids next year on that third section, that's going to allow more things for our students. And then you would add that each of the next three years, hopefully, and fill in whatever classes we needed to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question to staff if nobody else does. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, the public testimony portion of the public hearing is now closed. So I am going to look to commissioners for their questions, comments, or a motion. And Vice Chair Kane has already indicated that he has a question for staff. Ms. Elliott um, created doubt regarding the accuracy of the video and the accuracy of the census system. And she said that at some point in the CUP, maybe she didn't say CUP, she said at some point it was mandatory that we also have a tube count. Is it mandatory that we have a tube count? Um, and do we have a tube count? And should we have a tube count? A tube count was installed. That was required under condition number 19. And WTRANS, our consultant, also verified the tube count was functioning when they did their site visit. And they can provide additional information on how that data is uploaded. Well, did I miss something? Is the tube count data in here? We don't have the tube count data in the report. Condition 19 talks about comparing the census data and the video count. We have a comment. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Lisa Peterson, town engineer. So I did want to clarify that the tube count according to condition 19 is something that we use if they are out of compliance. So because the counts were taken and looked at by WTRANS, and what it says is they would be out of compliance if the census count, um, if the reading exceeded the census count by more than 5% and where the readings are above the maximum daily vehicle trips, which would be 880. So they have to, both of those things have to happen for them to be out of compliance. If both of those happen, then what the uh, condition 19 says is that the town, um, at that point, the town traffic engineer, if it, they find them out of compliance, then the town shall contract for additional data collection with a one week of compliance the um, with mechanical hose counts to verify the counts. So basically, if they're out of compliance, then what we do is we go and we get additional hose counts for one week to check the data, but they were not out of compliance, so we did not do that. Thank you for the clarification. I think that's important. Commissioner Hudas. Yeah, I just had some questions about the Im the traffic impact and um, what the reaction of the community has been to the measures that are in the CUP. So were there neighborhood complaints about traffic? And if so, what were they? Planning staff didn't receive any complaints from the neighbors. So there were basically, and going back for the whole year, there were no complaints about traffic? Planning or code compliance hasn't received any. Okay, thank you. All right, I have a question um, for staff. So we're relying on 28 days of data. It could even be just seven, depending upon the timing. And confirm this is acceptable per the CUP, that this is the only amount of data that we're to rely on for this review? So I guess it's one of those questions you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. The condition number that was read earlier to you specifically states what the ongoing compliance, and I think Commissioner O'Donnell brought that up. It was to be annually one year after the six-month review, and that is the time period we're in right now, and that co that is very specific as to the date. There's no misinterpretation of when this was supposed to come back for the annual review was, was after the six-month review that council did which was a year ago okay so a year from that we were supposed to do the annual review there's no other way to interpret it that it's supposed to come in front of you right now and your review is to both to, to to look specifically at whether they're in compliance with the conditional use permit doesn't say anything about the fact that you're going to even authorize the additional students it's whether you're in they're in compliance with the conditional use permit the clause that talks about whether they're entitled to additional students specifically says that they would be entitled to the 33, and this is going back now to condition 15, 33 in, in the year 2016-2017, up to an additional 33 in year 217 and 218. Didn't say who is going to make that determination, but it'll be determined if they are in compliance with the maximum numbers. There's absolutely no facts in front of you tonight that they're not in compliance with the maximum numbers. There may be a question of whether the counts are being done correctly under condition 19, but there's nothing in the um, um, facts and circumstances that said they're quite under the 880. So that's really your only determination of whether they're entitled to the additional 33 students. But as to whether this is the right timing, we could have made the call that, yeah, let's just wait another year, and then the interpretation would have been that they would be entitled to those students because they're still in compliance because all the data right now says there's been no counts that they're under the 880. So there is no loophole as far as an intent goes? A loophole CUP. of intent by who? We, we wrote the... We wrote the conditions well, of approval. I, I believe there was some discussion um, regards to whether this is a non-compliance issue or a timing issue, and they're kind of intertwined. So what you're telling us is that they're in compliance. There, there's nothing to tell us otherwise that they're not in compliance with the traffic Well, you, you certainly can, you can, you can look at whether there should be additional language or modifications or interpretation to, to condition number 19 
on the modific on the traffic count monitoring in the way it's being done, but there's actually been no testimony that they have exceeded the 880 trips that I have heard. Um, I mean, we're not even close. As the error there is is it's 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 not fathom that there's an error of that magnitude. Um, if we were very close to the 880 number, then then potentially you know you might have an issue there, but we're not even close to that number as to whether we do or not. We do have mechanisms, though. I mean, as we continue on, though, if, in fact, in the next few months, if there is the ability to find that they are over the 880 count, then you do have the enforcement provisions in here, and you do have the ability at any time to revoke or modify the conditions of approval. If at any time during this monthly counts, I mean, staff is very aware of this issue and how important it is to planning commission and the council. If we find that the counts are, are not being done correctly, we will be the first to, to bring it back to you or to request modifications or revocation or anything of the students if we find that. But right now, there's been no facts that they're close to the 880. Thank you, Mr. Schultz, for that clarification. Vice Chair Kane, followed by Commissioner Hansen, followed by Commissioner Hudis. Well, I was just looking to counsel for the second shoe. I understand if, if they are found to be not in compliance now or in the future, that there would be fines for the car trips and this and that. But would they, in fact, could it be a, possi uh, a piece of the, let me try it again, would they, in fact, have to reduce enrollment? Would they have to come back from the 33 previously established under which piece of the CUP they violated? Once they have increased the enrollment and vested, then no, you don't have the ability to decrease. You could put additional conditions on there, but you wouldn't be able to decrease the enrollment. We could do conditional, additional provisions of the CUP, or we could revoke it. And if we yes. revoke it, then does that affect their enrollment? Yes, then no. All right, thank you. Commissioner Hansen. Um, so this is another question for um, our town attorney, I think. Um, I remain troubled by this loophole that's created by the summer session because they didn't um, vest the CUP until August 31st. So we got this promise that they're going to be in compliance with the summer session and they're not technically out of compliance because they didn't vest it, but then we're being asked to see if they complied with the CUP for the entire year, but they don't have to comply with part of it because they didn't vest it. So I, I, I remain very troubled with it because they're, in com they're out of compliance with not only number 11, but number 15 in terms of the number of summer students just because they didn't vest until like August 31st, and that's uh, to come in the future next year. And so I, 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 I struggle with how that's in compliance. So again, your duty is to find if they're not in compliance or in compliance with the CUP, it wasn't to decide whether they're entitled if, to the extra students. The extra students is under the the one issue of whether there was 880 uh, counts over or during the summer. If you want to say that, then they were supposed to comply with it over the summer, on whether they violated it during the summer period. Well, they had, uh, there is a limit of the maximum number of students during the summer session is 150, and I thought we read somewhere that they had more than that in 2016. And I would just offer um, that I believe that was also stated by the applicant. Um, however, they were under the previous CUP until they vested the new CUP. So going forward, they will have to, they have to comply with all of these. So that's where they also mentioned that next year they will not be able to offer that program, um, and then they'll move forward from there. But, but I also understand your dilemma of, of the fact that they didn't have to comply with it. Now you're asking for a review of the CUP after 30 days. And again, we look at any permit. If you obtain an a ANS, if you contain a, get a CUP permit, because you that date granted, it doesn't vest and they don't have to do anything under that ANS or in any, any CUP and still they begin to do work. If they go out and get a construction loan, that doesn't mean now they have to do everything in the conditional use permit. If they enter into a lease agreement for a downtown business, that doesn't mean they now have to do everything in the conditional use permit until they open the doors, until they begin grading, until they do something is, is the date when they have now the requirements. In this case, there wasn't any physical construction. So the only way we could attach it to it is the date that we had um, knowledge of the enrollment, and we did not use the date that because someone had paid, because you could 
and just like a construction loan, you could get one and not go through. You could have students that paid but didn't show up and went to a different school. And so we had to make a determination, and that determination was it would vest the date that the enrollment occurred. When they do their enrollment um, to the state is really what we thought was the fair one to do. Vice Chair Kane. We're talking about an annual review um, for the town attorney, for the director of community development. We're talking about an annual review, but if the counters show that there has been excess of the 880, they have some monetary fines to look at that have been described as pretty stiff. But would that also trigger that we could take it under review right then and there and have to wait for an annual review? Yes. yes. That's, that's what I said earlier. Yes, I, I want to underscore We would be back I, very quickly if we found they're not in compliance of this permit. Community. I want to underscore it because I'm going to make a motion. Um, and the motion is that there's no evidence in front of us that the CUP has been violated, but we have talked about substantial financial fines, which is one thing. But breaking the hearts of 33 kids and having to disenroll them is another thing. And given that you haven't violated it yet, but given that you know you, you could, you would have to come back to court if you did, and the penalties would be extremely se se severe, I'm going to um, make a motion uh, to determine that Tilbrook School is in compliance with their conditional use permit, and I find no further environmental analysis is required. And if, and, if, and if people want to put conditions on that number 15 or 25, as the town attorney said, I'm open to it. All right. At this point, do I have a second? You may ask a question, but Commissioner Hudis had his hand up before you. I'm, I'm going to withhold my question until okay. we have a motion. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm. So we don't have a motion. So. A motion, not a second. The question I have is the, the report. The report indicates we uh, we have to do two things, and as I understand the motion, you're only proposing one, but I think that's inadvertent. Uh, so if, if you look at the two things we're supposed. To, does your motion include both? Yeah, I threw it in. Okay, I threw it in at the end. I would second it if it includes both the things that our report says. Find that no further environmental analysis is required and that the school is in compliance with their CUP. I would second. Currently. All right. Further discussion? Commissioner Hudis. Um, so I had, uh, first of all, a question on enrollment um, since we're reviewing the CUP and looking at number of students. Um, is it is my understanding correct that um, a carryover is not permitted? In other words, that they're permitted up to 33 in year 2016 to 2017 if they only admit um, 23 or 26, whatever that number is, they're not entitled to carry the difference over to the following year. Is that correct? That's not correct. They can carry it forward. The addition is to allow up to 99, and it was split into three years, so that's why it was 33 students per uh, school year as referenced in uh, Condition 15. Because the way I read it, it says, maybe the attorney can comment on this, um, with an increase of 315 up to 33 in year 2016 to 2017, up to an additional 33 in year 2017 to 2018. Correct. The maximum carryover goes up to the 414, though. They can't do more than 33 that those three years, but in the fourth or subsequent years, they could increase to get to the 414. I see. So it would have to be after yes. um, th those three, three years. Those they're three they're years limited are to the additional 33, okay. but they're up to a maximum of 414. Okay. Um, that was my question on enrollment. All right. So we have a motion on the table and a second. Commissioner Hudis. Um, I just wanted to... Um, discuss with staff in terms of the way that um, number 19 is evaluated. I think we have some evidence that there's a systematic undercount with the existing system, at least based on the sample, the six-day sample that we have, and it averages out to about 5%. And so I, um, I would, when if I look at a 5% reduction off of 880, that's 44, which takes it down to 836. So I would ask the staff if they'd be willing to monitor um, the traffic counts 
and if they get above 836 um, to uh, start to take a look at the situation because I think based on that systematic undercounting that we're seeing, that number equates to 880 if it were video counted. Does that make sense? So, yes, uh, thank you for the question or the um, question. We can certainly take a look at it, but again, uh, in order for them to be out of compliance, it would have to, the census um, counts would have to be more than 5% and the readings would have to be above the maximum number of daily vehicle trips. So that is the CUP requirement and we would need to follow that to determine compliance. Right. What I'm What I'm saying is that we have evidence that they're very close to that 5% issue um, in front of us now. Um, and so, you know, given that, um, would staff be willing to take a look at the numbers and if they are going over 836 to take a closer look at the situation and, and verify whether they're um, counting? Because if that were the case, then they would be um, out of compliance with both aspects of that sentence. So we we could take a look at that, and we would make sure that they are in compliance via the CUP. Yeah, because I assume we'll be looking at this again, um, and so for in my mind, with that systematic issue, that my my magic number is eight thirty six. That's that's uh, we can definitely do that. Additionally, for your next annual review next year, um, we will have a spring semester um, count an additional fall semester count, and then all of the monthly uh, data to uh, use. Commissioner O'Donnell. That also presupposes continuing existence of a variation of greater than 5%. So you'd have to find that there was continuing variation of greater than 5%. Then the 80, uh, 836 would be a very reasonable uh, action. If you found out we were 5% or below, then you wouldn't have to do the 836. I, I agree with that comment. I just want to make sure that there are really three things going on. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, any further discussion? Um, based on the legal advice provided by our town attorney, <laughs> I will be reluctantly supporting the motion. Um, I was disappointed with the continuation of the summer program. I know it benefited your school and certain students, but it, it did not do anything for the neighborhood as far as creating any um, good faith feelings between them. There's There's been a long history of mistrust with this neighborhood. And I think with the uh, provisions of the CUP, had you adhered to that in good faith for that 2015 year, it would have gone a long ways in, in mending the fences um, that exist here. Any further comments? All right, Commissioner Hansen. I remain uncomfortable with the timing on this. I'm, I mean, clearly for the very small set of data that we've been provided with, there are a few days that are in compliance. We haven't seen the days when they're going to have significantly above the normal, the, like the exception days. They, you know, a couple of them existed in September, but we weren't given the data for them. And so I, I remain uncomfortable in this whole idea of them that they didn't have to be in compliance, but then we're judging them to be in compliance even though they didn't vest it. I, I, I just it doesn't make sense to me and I, I think that um, there should have been more time added um, to determine if they're in compliance and have the kind of data that was specified in the intent of the, the CUP terms. So I will not be supporting the motion. Commissioner O'Donnell. My problem is that we are told specifically what we have to do and it isn't a question whether we're comfortable or, or we aren't comfortable. We're given a very narrow band of what we're allowed to do. And if your discomfort means you're going to vote against it, that's fine. Uh, but I find myself constrained by the language of paragraph 19. If you choose to ignore paragraph 19, then your discomfort, of course, would result in a no vote. Any further comments? All right. Um, I will call the question. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes four to one, Commissioner Hansen opposed. Mr. Paulson, are there appeal rights of the actions of the commission on this item? This is an annual review. There are not appeal rights uh, for this action. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Kane, no? Okay. Oh, appeal rights. 
but it's an ongoing dynamic situation. And complaints can, complaints can be made to code enforcement, to, to planning department. It's an ongoing dynamic of whether or not we have compliance. Yes, every month we will be looking at the numbers. All right, um, Mr. Paulson, do you have a report for us this evening? Uh, yes, a brief report. Since we met last, um, the council on October 4th considered the parking requirements for restaurants that the commission had looked at before. Um, they decided to um, forward that information along with a number of the other items uh, revolving around economic vitality to the town council policy committee so they will be taking that up and it may be coming back through the process through the planning commission back to the council depending on uh, what direction they believe is appropriate thank you mr paulson um, i would like to make mention that today is the 27th anniversary of the loma prieta earthquake so i would like to uh, thank our community for rallying to the support uh, in rebuilding our town and supporting each other during such a difficult time we celebrate you and thank you all for being here tonight uh, any commissioners have anything else to bring to our attention other than the fact that we're, we are going to meet again on wednesday for a study session no see none this meeting's adjourned thank you for coming <laughs>